with quantum machine learning, why are people excited about that? Like, why were you excited about that? Why have you spent so much time researching it? Like, yeah, what is the potential in quantum machine learning? Uh, you know, it sounds kind of like you're saying, well, you know, we don't yet know of many other applications of quantum computing. And yet it seems like there, 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 there could be something here with quantum machine learning. Like, why is it exciting? Why are people pursuing that? Yeah, so maybe maybe let's start by um, like rewinding a little bit as to what quantum machine learning is or what do I mean when I speak about it? Because I think there are a lot of different ways to think about it and then we can kind of motivate a little bit some of the successes because you're right. I mean, from a complexity theory point of view, this very high level point of view, it seems a bit counterintuitive when I say like quantum computers aren't good for hard problems. But um, you'll see that I think there are still pockets and areas that quantum computers can be super useful for. And one of them is, is machine learning. So when I say quantum machine learning, there are um, a couple of ways to think about it. The first is like, well, you know, in, in regular machine learning, we're always concerned with a data set and we want to do something with that data. We maybe want to learn some structure or we want to kind of apply some labels to a new piece of information that comes in from a, you know, a distribution that looks like this data set and so on. So there's usually some notion of data. Um, and in the quantum machine learning picture, we can, we can say, okay, maybe this data is something classical, like our pixels in a picture like, that we put into a vector, you know, maybe it's just a classical vector. Um, but there's also this idea of uh, or notion of quantum data and uh, and what this means, we can we can talk about a little bit later. But um, but basically, when we have data in this quantum mach quantum machine learning picture, we need to encode it into a quantum state. So we need to somehow get it into the quantum computer to be able to process it. Right. So this is step one. Step two is then once it's in the quantum computer, what once it exists as a quantum state, what do we do to it? Right. Like how do we evolve the quantum state? How do we change it? How do we apply operations to it that's meaningful? And then the step three, the last step, of course, is how do we measure our quantum system to get an output that is useful for us in machine learning? Like if we want to label the picture cat or dog, how do we interpret a bit string measurement uh, you know, out of our quantum system such that it tells us it's a cat or a dog? And there are many different ways to do that. There are many different ways to encode data, to evolve it, and to read out. And so when people do quantum machine learning, 99% of the time, they're trying to study how these aspects work and how we should do them under certain assumptions, right? Because it's, it's almost impossible to say, um, this is a blanket approach to encode every piece of information. This is a blanket approach to evolve every piece of information. And this is how you should read it out. It really always depends. It depends on the structure of your data, your, your specific machine learning task and, um, and what it is you want to do, right? So quantum machine learning is really these three ingredients and in understanding how these three things work, how to put the data into a quantum state how to evolve it and how to like understand it in terms of a label for a machine learning task. So, um, okay. So I hope that makes sense. And then we can like, talk about some... okay. Okay. Good. And yeah. I think I've, I've got it. Yeah. Like, so, uh, with quantum machine learning, we need to first convert our data into a quantum state. And I do definitely want to dig later. I've made a note and I'm not going to let it okay. slide <laughs> about this quantum data idea, which is completely novel to me. Um, but yeah, so start with converting the, data into a quantum state. And then I wrote down perform operations, but you actually used a different uh, verb or, uh, or now. Like you, you, what, yeah, evolve, in, in this, uh, evolve, but performing evolve. operations, exactly the same thing, right? Yeah, so let's, let's oh, okay. use that. Yeah, I think it's the evolve, same. You can think about the same sounds way. cooler. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we're performing operations in classical machine learning all the time. I want, ev I want evolution. That sounds way cooler. Um, <laughs> And, and then the third state, uh, or the, th the third step, sorry, is then converting back from the quantum state into something that we can easily interpret, like a vector of pixels or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so then to your, to your next point about like, um, now how, how would this be advantageous? And here, um, there are a couple of interesting things or results that, that have come out. And I think probably... Probably the most intuitive one to to a machine learning or data science audience is this idea of um, kernel methods and um, and support vector machines, which quantum computers seem very naturally suited for. So, for those of you, I just like recap very quickly, like you know, the idea of a support vector machine and and these kernel methods is, 
you know, usually your data is given to you in a very, um, in a very like messy sort of, um, sort of space or set, like a setting, right? So let's say you've, you're given a ton of information and now you want to kind of classify this information into two subsets, let's say cats and dogs, for example. So you can, you can, you know, try to fit a very complicated classifier to say, okay, this is, these are the cats and these are the dogs and this is how I classify my data. But another thing you could do is you could take your data and you could map it to a different space such that it becomes really easy to separate your classes with a very simple classifier, like a linear classifier, right? So like just like drawing a line between these two, these two data sets, these two uh, subsets in your data. And how people typically do this is they take their data and they map it to a higher dimensional space. And there in a higher dimensional space, things kind of become easy. You can, you can like have a hyperplane, which is like, you know, you can think of it as like a, a generalization of a linear classifier that separates your classes. So this is like this idea of what a support vector machine does. It, it takes your data and it maps it by something called a, a feature map into a higher dimensional space and then applies a linear classifier, right? So, so why is this interesting for quantum and quantum machine learning? Well, because the step one that I told you about, which is like taking your data and encoding it into a quantum state, you can actually think of it as this map into a higher dimensional space. So you can think about like taking your data and trying to encode it into a quantum state as a quantum feature map. And then you can apply these operations, which can be a linear classifier. So if you figure out a clever way to map your data in, onto a quantum computer, such that you kind of already separating things in a nice way in you know quantum space, or we call it quantum Hilbert space, um, then this is super interesting and super useful, right? And moreover, if you show that this mapping is something very hard for a classical computer to do, then you're in the money, right? So there, like, you've got a useful kernel, uh, or useful, I should say, feature map, and um, and you know you can you can kind of use it for these these uh, these machine learning tasks. So there have been some some interesting results here where people have shown that certain quantum feature maps and quantum um, you know these quantum support vector machines and so on. Are classically intractable, meaning they're you know they're difficult for classical computers to do. But the one downside is that the data sets that seem to be amenable to these maps are very artificial. So they don't seem to be naturally suited for data that we have in, in nature and in real life. So people are still trying to figure out if there's a natural quantum feature map that suits data sets that we're interested in. So this is still an open question. So there's been some 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 proofs that there are some hard things you know that a classical computer can't do but we still need to find some use cases for them very cool that was magnificently explained as well thank you so much that was like that was an absolute delight to hear and the kind of i guess the summary point here is that with quantum support vector machines with qsvms while there have been theoretical demonstrations that QSVMs um, provide, you know, can can in some circumstances provide a great speed up over a classical support vector machine solution. That is only the case with data that we aren't aware of, like uh, data that are set up in a way that that we we don't seem to observe uh, from some natural phenomenon that 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 would typically occur and that we would be putting into our models. Yeah, exactly. Yeah.